Hi everyone, and we are here with um, one of the, my favorite people to work with, um, Dr. Tonya Matthews. Um, she is the Chief Executive Officer of the International African American Museum at, uh, in Charleston. And um, this museum is one of the nation's newest platforms for the disruption of institutionalized racism as we all continue to work and walk towards a more perfect union. Um, a thought leader in inclusive frameworks, social entrepreneurship and education, um, Dr. Matthews has written articles and books, books chapters across a wide range of subjects. Um, she has founded the Steminista Project, a movement to help girls um, think about their futures, um, looking at role models. And my favorite part, she's also a poet <laughs> and is included in 100 Best African-American Poems. Um, she received her PhD in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins um, and her um, engineering degree from Duke, alongside a certification in African-American studies. My goodness. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I couldn't be happier to have you here. So welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you. I, I want to ask you to, I, I won't put you on the spot, but maybe later we can hear your poems. But um, so Tonya, tell us, um, tell us what the last two years have been like for you in the multiple communities that you, mm -hmm. that you work and live in. Yeah, so it's been interesting. Um, I have been a, one of the uh, the the bold or the the fortunate or the just flat out crazy uh, that have jumped communities uh, in the last two years. Uh, and so um, when we sort of began this phase of whatever this is, I was in uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, and I'm now in uh, Charleston. Uh, South Carolina. And so I think one of the, the things that's very different is, you know, you know that those two communities have different paces, right? You know, the bigger cities are thought of as faster, vibrant, sort of those kinds of things. Um, and so I think the forced slowdowns and, and sort of shutdowns kind of affected um, Detroit um, in a very interesting way, right? A, a community that's used to being frenetic. Um, we're also a high density community, high um, African American population community. And so we were definitely, we had our moment as an epicenter, right? You know, we, we had our moment where we had um, some of the, the highest numbers and the most devastating um, conversations around this, um, which also meant that we were also seeing outliers, right? So for a city like Detroit, it really isn't, this is just dangerous for, say, our older individuals or our individuals with pre-existing conditions. You know, we're such a large, dense um, uh, community. That, you know, we had um, one of the first folks that I lost um, to uh, the pandemic was slightly younger than me. No pre-existing conditions until mm -hmm. we were sort of buddies in, in the work and the movement. Uh, and so I think that experience was very different. Uh, for us uh, coming into uh, the Charleston community. So I've been here for uh, a little over six months or so. So on, on the one hand, we may be arguably or arguably not coming out of this phase. Um, but I think the real difference is this is a community that um, is less dense um, and also is warmer year round, which you don't really think about, but it actually makes a difference in terms of people's ability to leave the house, mm -hmm. right? Um, and still be distances, uh, distance. So these quote unquote safe ways mm -hmm. of being in community and outside. Um, and so that some very cultural and political differences uh, there um, and also um, museum community and uh, higher academia community. So I've, I've also been in those two spaces during this period. And what was really interesting about that, um, as real as the struggle was for, for academia, we, we all know the struggles right now about you know moving uh, school online. Um, it was kind of a, an understood challenge. Okay, we know we have to do, we simply have to move this classroom online. We need the tools, we need the tech, we need the training, but it's very straightforward uh, in terms of what we were attempting to do. On the museum side, these arts and culture spaces, we were making it up. We were making it up. That, that included, I don't know, but perhaps the first three months of denial, <laughs> another, <laughs> another three months of just waiting for it to go away, <laughs> so, so, you know, trying to figure these things out. 
Um, so we're making up these experiences um, uh, in terms of thinking, how do we translate ourselves into this virtual space? How do we compete with the fact that now school is in the virtual space? Because I think one of the, the big things is being able to have a learning environment that can differentiate itself mm. from your classic in the classroom. If we're mm. both coming to you on the same screen, how do we how do we put the excitement back? Mm. How do how are we different? Uh, and then also in the sort of the real talk hard to to take a uh, kind of space um, when you're in an environment where sort of people coming through the door is also where your business is, it's where your revenue yeah. is. It actually defines the number of people you have on the ground. So we were also struggling with those issues. You know, how do we maintain our staff, support our staff? You know, how do we, um, when we had to let our staff go under the best yeah. circumstances possible, which frankly, there's no such thing to that last phrase. Um, and so I think it was very interesting um, being in, in those, those, those two communities uh, as we work through that. And being the leader of that ship, right? It's really hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think being, uh, being a leader, um, and that's whether or not you have the title of the yeah. leader, or you find yourself as perhaps the emotional center of your organization, mm -hmm. right? You know, they're, they're unspoken um, leaders. And so I want to give a nod uh, to those who don't have the title, mm -hmm. but who were leaders within their community and, and the pressure, um, not only of making the best decision um, when um, we're making it up, um, but also, frankly, the emotional and spiritual weight. Mm. Um, of knowing that the best decision does not mean that this is a good decision for everyone that's involved, right? Uh, and having to, I think, to think through that um, and, uh, you know, the quote unquote, never let them see a sweat, uh, mm. sort of that kind of thing was now actually being balanced with also a new awareness of, I think we went through a phase where we really needed each other's humanity, Right. Um, and so reporting up to a robot <laughs> or, or looking to was was not helpful. Right. It was mm -hmm. not. So and and um, and false, um, you know, false. Um, not not false hope, because I don't actually think that the words mm -hmm. false and hope go together ever. Hope is hope. Right. It, it doesn't it doesn't actually get qualifiers. Um, but I think sort of um, falsely communicating sentiments of this is going to be all right and we're just fine and sort of that kind of thing mm -hmm. be really became less and less encouraging and critical, especially in year two. Yeah, yeah, critically transparent, right? Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things is um, that that I saw is that also depended on what community you were in. So that argument started to wear thin in some communities earlier than it did in others, right? So if you're in a high impact community, or perhaps you were personally impacted, right? And so also you're you're watching the ways that people are sort of taking this information in when they, they need a new message or, or a new way. So I thought that it was um, really interesting in that. Um, I will have to say that I think one of my advantages in this period was being trained as an engineer. You know, mm -hmm. I've got the whole left brain, right brain thing going. Um, and you would think perhaps that it was perhaps the poet in me, that the, the huggy feely, the heartfelt, I can get all that sympathy out there. I can just embrace the world in this moment of trauma. And I think there was a bit of that that was true, but it was really the fact that engineers are trained to solve problems. And I was in problem solving mode almost constantly, mm. right? Because uh, and, they're coming so fast. Because it's coming so fast. Um, and for me, though, problem solving mode is not considered a negative. That's mm -hmm. what you'll find about a lot of engineers, right? It, it's, not, it's not a negative. So problems for us are not um, intrinsically negative. And so when I was in that mode, I think it was also protective uh, for me because I, I put myself in a space. That's in your control. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, it wasn't actually about control it was about something to do yep yep right right yep. you know it's like, it's like you can make okay. a difference <laughs> it's like okay you know as opposed to i don't know what to do i don't know what to do Ooh, that's like engineer happy place so sort of kind of thing um and then sort of being a, a research scientist it doesn't have to work it just has to give you new information at the mm. end and so I think um, I have no idea how productive or helpful I was, um, but I do. So think what did you do? Yeah, I mean, I think for the museum, how did you connect with your communities? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, when it began, um, I was and maybe actually... tell us a little bit sure. more about the museum uh, oh, and sure. what, what what do you do and what 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 is um success for you all. Sure. So uh, the International African American Museum, as you mentioned, um, is is coming online. So we are actually in the final stages of construction uh, of, a, of our space. Um, and then we're looking forward to beginning exhibition installation uh, in um, uh, early next year, hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all of that good stuff. Um, and so we are being built at the site of Gadsden's Wharf. Now, uh, Gadsden's Wharf, which is now actually a UNESCO um, heritage site um, on the African um, slave trade route. Um, we are now thought of as um, one of the most, if not the most productive slave trading port into what is now the United States. So um, upwards of 40 to, up to upwards of 50 percent, um, depending on, on how you're looking at it, of enslaved peoples um, came through this very spot. Mm. And so that's the spot that we're using to uh, create the museum. Uh, and part of part of what we're doing is so we are a museum that includes that story, but fully acknowledges that this is the full African-American journey uh, that began before. I mm -hmm. uh, had a moment during and continues after and is also being created in the now. Uh, and so thinking through that, um, um, and, you know, one of the interesting things about this time is that we are having a moment where no one's really arguing about the fact that history does make a difference in today, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're having that moment right now where we are in this clear space of understanding clearly history affects today and unresolved history is a problem mm -hmm. uh, as it comes today. And so, um, you know, we are in a moment where I think that um, not only that the message is translating, um, but that folks are looking to see who's talking about these things uh, and who can give insight. Um, so in terms of COVID, you know, our situation was very interesting um, because we were still um, in that in that preface, so we're building the programming. Um, we're doing some online programming and trying to get the word out, being more in the community because we don't necessarily have a building yet. And so, on the positive side, um, uh, what the the period did is it normalized online engagement, mm. right? It normalized right virtual engagement. And so we weren't necessarily battling upstream uh, for that, mm -hmm. right? So, so we were in that space. Um, but the interesting challenge for us was we were also in a place of building our own community. I mean, the community of the museum itself, mm -hmm. right? So we were new in that space. We were also building our own relationships with each other across teams, across departments, individuals, onboarding new people. And so... There's been a lot of talk about how hard it is to onboard, you know, in a pandemic. Oh, it's think about what that means at scale. Yeah. If your entire team is essentially onboarding during a pandemic. And so I think that has actually been one of the interesting challenges for us. Um, I think the community that we were speaking to, they were in a space where us speaking to them virtually was normalized at that point, right? And they're looking forward to one day being able to set foot in the building, but they expected us to be speaking to them from other venues. Um, but for ourselves, it wasn't normal, right? We'd just gotten to know each other. We were in temporary spaces, no opportunity for distancing. You know, the spaces were small and temporary and by definition, underventilated. <laughs> um, and so I, I think for us, um, that was uh, an interesting challenge. Um, and I think for me, um, I was, I'll say fortunate um, to be able to be experiencing that myself, which I think helped me um, to, to, to be able to, to work with the staff on this because I onboarded to the museum during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. So this was a this was a shift for me. So I'm coming in trying to feel, well, how am I going to get to know people, you know, or sort of on this team? How, how am I going to be present? You know, they like their leader to be present. How am I going to be present? I've experimented with everything from, you know, obviously we have team meetings to one on ones, virtual office hours. I'm just going to sit on Zoom. See if anyone pops <laughs> in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The innovation. Has been yeah. um, a virtual organ. I mean, we've yeah. had a virtual team since we started 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been just so interesting to see how the pushback in the early years about this model can't work 
and now I'm like it's working <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. and now of course yeah. everybody understands that um so what have you seen I think from from your lens I mean you you've um you're an educator you've been working on the STEM minister project maybe you can tell us a little bit about that yeah. but what do, are you seeing is is working for families to mm. continue learning so as they're I, navigating yeah so I think you know whoa has this been an awakening okay uh I think in, in terms of that um and so you know what I've seen for families have been a couple of things right which is um you know a renewed respect for the learning curve that students are on right um you know when you actually have to be the the, the tutor or the teacher you're thinking wow this this is a lot right so I think there's a renewed learning curve for the students as well as this obvious appreciation for understanding you know um, educators and and what it's like to to be in the classroom so and both sides I think teachers seeing of having a window into the child's life too right Actually, and I think definitely when you're working with, um, you know, students, we, we like to say diverse students, under, you know, resource students, whatever your, whatever your word and acronym is, um, I think many of our educators really didn't have a sense yep. of where it is um, our children were going, going back into. And we had a rough start there, right? You know, we had this cameras must be on kind of moment without actually pausing for thinking, is the camera off for a reason, right? Mm. Is is there something the student um, knows better than to show you, um, mm. is, is embarrassed about, about seeing and sort of those kinds of things. And so I think we went through that um, as well. Um, I think also, um, you know, parents and families trying to create um, simultaneous productivity space, right? Um, and so, you know, the the rearranging that we did of, of our homes um, and, you know, space to do that aside in a time when everything feels like it's in complete disarray and it's changing all around you arguably your personal and private space is the one thing you should be able to depend on right mm. and having to reroute and uproot that and move that and share that I think also added to mm -hmm. the feeling of ungroundedness right? Um, the, the one place you should be able to just hunker down and just be in is also getting turned upside down. You're having to share it. Um, so I think that that was also very tough um, uh, for, for families uh, to deal with. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the, the inability to postpone tough conversations, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, you know, during the pandemic, it put a, a laser focus on many, um, you know, national in America and global issues for us around justice, social justice, injustice, um, race relations, all of these, these kinds of things that the violence and brutality that we were reckoning with, arguably, many of these conversations are things parents would have put off for a little while. Or, well, let me go to a class or a session or a workshop first, and then I'm going to come back. Or perhaps I can talk to my neighbor, see how they're doing it. Well, you can try those things, but your kid is probably in the next room listening to the Zoom workshop that you're trying to understand. <laughs> you know how you're going to get into this this conversation and so i think that's also something else right one parents um you know, what's an example a, of such a topic so i mean the the obvious example uh would be around george floyd mm -hmm. right completely unavoidable completely unavoidable um and in many ways um you know i found some some of the the, the conversations and stories i were i was hearing were um um, scarily akin to the conversation that parents have with their children about sex, right? Mm -hmm. Which tends to be too little too late, right? By the mm -hmm. time you're trying to have the talk, um, your child is telling you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, you know, I'm, I'm on this level. What about this particular thing? And the parents are like, whoa, I didn't know you understood and you saw that. And, you know, and that's mm -hmm. in kind of those embarrassing sort of moments, you know, rites of passage for a parent and child kind of thing. When you shift that to something like, you know, race and racial violence, um, it has the same amount of shock value, but it goes in a very, very different way. So for a parent to understand that their child has already been seeing this, mm -hmm. already been grappling with, they, they knew that it wasn't right and, and they understood those kinds of things. Um, there's probably no worse version of that conversation than discovering that your child was not surprised. Mm. 
right? Um, particularly since a lot of the adults were, right? A lot of, a lot of the parents were. Um, and even for those families where they were all experiencing it anew, mm-hmm. you know, and, and having, to, having to explain that. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is that um, children, particularly young children, are a beautiful reflection of, of who we aspire to be. Right. And, and, and the phrases and the words that we use. And so if you think, say, of a, uh, a white female um, girl child looking at the George Floyd video and being afraid for her own safety, you're thinking, wait, how, do, how did you make that leap? But it's a pure interpretation mm-hmm. that um, our police force is here to protect us no matter what. Mm-hmm. And that you only um, get in trouble with the police if you do something wrong. So if you're watching with that lens and you understand, wait, that person didn't do anything wrong. And wait, that's that's the police. So you mean if I'm not doing anything wrong and I meet the police, I might still be in danger? Right. So as we're watching those kinds of, of interpretations of our youngest children, I think it was a, an interesting reckoning and awakening for us. Uh, and then as we get to our older children, our older students who really do understand what's happening. So now you're you're working through the fear, you're working through the anger, um, but also in its in its purest form, right? W- without the caveats, without the excuses, you know, sort of without the the, the, the false barriers. And so I think that that was um, a, a really a really tough time. And I think um, part of what we're also seeing now is, you know, a parent's um, instinctual responsibility is to protect, mm-hmm. right? And so when you're getting in this space and you can't protect your children, be that a physical, spiritual, emotional thing, um, you've got all kinds of reactions, some healthy, most not, uh, mm. I think. I think in terms of that, and so as we're watching a lot of these these conversations, where people are so angry and they're not talking and they're not communicating, part of the way I relate to those conversations is I understand that what I'm looking at um, is a parent who is worried that they are failing to protect their mm. child. And the way that's going to come out is going to be all versions of irrational. Uh, and so I think that that's also part um, of, of, of what we're seeing as, as folks are dealing with some of this. So these are all things that I'm sure you're keeping in mind as you're mm-hmm. opening the museum, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what would be the goals of your, um, when you open the doors and uh, for someone to, how would you think that their ideas and attitudes and behaviors would shift? Yeah, so that's a really good point because these are all things that interfere with education, right? It's, you know, if you're thinking about what you need to be in a space to receive new information, right? Um, uh, But I think that um, it has been um, a necessary um, fishbowl experience, right, Um, of understanding the level and the scale of difference in perspective um, mm. that, that would be coming uh, to the museum, um, a reminder of how... I guess um, somebody who chooses sure. to come to the museum is already in a bit of a different place, do you think? So so let's let's go with that. Let's say, you know, 80 to 90 percent, right, are already in a different place, um, but they are probably not where they think they are. Mm. Yeah, and I sure. and I think that's what we were sort of. That, I mm. mean, that's kind of I think what we what we run into. It's like, oh, this would be great. I think I know this story. I love this story. You know, um, you're thinking, oh, you know, I have become so. One of the the um, cultural distinctions of our community uh, is the Gullah Geechee peoples, um, which African American um, culture that has been preserved. Um, and sweetgrass baskets. Listen, if you're mm. coming to Charleston, you're coming for a sweetgrass basket, okay? And so you're thinking, oh, this is amazing. Um, I love- What is a sweetgrass basket? So it's, a, I should have pictures. It's a beautiful hand-woven basket mm. um, of these multi-layered, um, you know, uh, brown uh, colors. It's, it's woven by hand out of sweetgrass, mm. but mm. woven so well, you can put water in it. Water's not mm. going to go through. Comes in all kinds of shapes. Um, so it's amazing craft. Um, and you know, a lot of folks know that like, great, we're going to go there. I love these baskets. Oh, I love this culture. So let's go to this museum, right? Cause I'm sure mm-hmm. they're going to talk about that. And yes, we do, but you're also coming into the full context of the reason that this culture exists and was created was, is, um, foundationally related to the fact that these were enslaved peoples that were isolated. 
Mm. Um, and that were considered um, commodity rather than human. And so there wasn't even a sense of we need to indoctrinate them in the culture. You know, we'll mm. leave them out there with the snakes and the alligators and whatever else is happening. And they'll, they'll, they'll be enslaved. Um, they're, they're bringing us the rice that we need to, to make all this money. And so part of what we're actually looking at is the way a people protected themselves, their spirit and their heritage in this space. You were just going to learn about a basket. Right. And so so now you're actually also in a space where you're confronted, you know, kind of by the the horrors um, of, of mm. slavery uh, and, and sort of that kind of thing. And so so I think keeping uh, keeping that in mind, um, we are obviously um, in a space where we realize that there are unspoken, untold pieces of our history per community. Right. Um, and so we want to be sensitive to that, um, but we want to be authentic to that. Um, and I think one of our biggest challenges is how do we train ourselves to be prepared for the 50 different predictable reactions, mm -hmm. you know, that we're going to get and the 52 unpredicted reactions, you know, that you're going to get in this space. You know, what is what is your approach? Is your approach um um, educator? Is it um, sympathizer? Is it mm. empathizer? Is it pontificator? It, you know, so what, what is our reaction, um, you know, in that space as we are essentially um, facilitating a journey, right? Mm. We're, we're, we don't need all the answers, don't have all the answers, but we are going to be um, co-facilitators, you know, of, of people's journey. Uh, yeah. in that space. Uh, so I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think that um, what does follow up look like? Like every museum talks about how it needs to be like not a one and done experience. You've got to have follow up. You've got to have sort of reflection. I would argue that for a museum that's in the space that we are, it's, it's actually very real and very, very necessary, right? Because mm -hmm. you can come in so education is not, ooh, and my mother's not going to like this phrase, but let me finish it <laughs> as, I, as I came to. Okay. So education is not transformation, right? Education is transformative when it includes reflection, mm. right? And you yeah. can go through a museum and be fully educated. You can take all this information in, but if there but is no, no change moment, in behavior, maybe. Yep. If there's no moment for reflection, mm -hmm. then all you've done is take on new, new facts. So that is not transformation. Um, that is not competency. That's sort of none of those kinds of things. And, because... and maybe the online pieces here, the mm -hmm. online connections are a great way to continue. It's really important. I am actually part of, um, uh, part of a, a working group, a learning community right now. And I've been fascinated about how they master that. So we've got mm -hmm. all these master speaker lecture series, wonderful lectures. I mean, it's great. You're in there, you're asking questions. It's mind blowing stuff. So they have the formalized part. And then for every one of those formalized parts, there are these optional post-reflection workshops. Mm. You know, because they're literally taking that into account. Hey, listen, if you really want some time to reflect and do this, and you know, everybody, it. everybody can sign up. No more than eight to 10 people in any mm -hmm. of these groups will send in a facilitator. And so it's models like that that I'm actually looking at, right? Which is, yep, you're going to come in, get all this information, you know, be bombarded. Maybe some folks will take a moment in, the, in our exterior gardens and actually do some reflection. Um, but I think being deliberate about offering it yeah. is really going to be, um, yeah. have to be a part. Of yeah, I love that. Well, we are so out of time and we, <laughs> yes. I have we are just the beginning <laughs> of my list of questions, but um, I'll ask you just a couple more. Um, sure. So did you feel that you had energy to create and write your poems? Ah, uh, you did know. Did you write any? That is such a good question because all artists were like, this is great. I'm isolated. I should be able to focus and do. It was, it was actually really interesting. Um, I actually did, uh, was doing writing, but I actually found I was using um, a different uh, writing style. Mm -hmm. I actually went into prose, right? And so I found that in this period, I was doing more editorializing. Mm -hmm. um, and probably it was more, it was closer to journaling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, um, a lot of my poetry is about the world I see. 
uh, and and what um, what I would suggest. Right? Poets can suggest things, um, but in this period, I was actually doing more reflection. I was watching myself, and so it was more about mm -hmm. um, about what I was feeling, what I was going through, and how that you know um, was because of the world, which for some reason my my brain or my inspiration space put that in a different genre of writing. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I found because I can also feel as I'm coming out of this phase that I'm back into the poetry. Yeah. It's, it was a, yeah. Um, what is one book you would recommend for us? Okay. So I'm all, <laughs> into, I got new books, but I really do have a new favorite and it's also a new book. So hopefully maybe some folks haven't even read it yet. Um, it's how the word is passed. Uh, so this is this is this is a new one, and I I lose ten points for not remembering the author <laughs> um, right now. That is, but the that title is, is very is, memorable. Yes, it's how oh. it's how the word is passed, um, and um, oh, it's by um, Clint Smith. Okay, mm. and it's you know the long title is a reckoning of slavery in America. Mm. But what he does is he picked um, all these different places over the country that he was just going to go to and see how the story was told, mm. because he he's an African American male, but he came to this understanding that we don't tell the story right or the same way from place to place, and even mm. as as aware as he found himself to be. Mm. So it's really interesting, kind of walking um, that journey with him. It's it's very mm. unassuming. Um, and he runs into this sort of cast of characters, some names he changes, you know, some um, he doesn't, obviously, with their permission. And I think that readers will find yourself, you might mm. find yourself to be the narrator, you might find yourself to be one of the folks he ran into when he was at Montpelier, you know, you know, flipping the script on, you know, one of the greatest American presidents and sort of all of these different kinds of things. And so, mm. so if you want to get into the space in a safe yep. way, you can do yep. how the word is passed. I, I can't wait. Um, and last question for yes. you. Uh, what should we be working on with intention? Empathy. Mm. That So that's my, this had been, even the past year um, was my, was a year of radical empathy for me. I was, I was trying mm -hmm. to do it as a, as a practice. And I think that if we, if we pause for a second and we look around, I would argue that one of the biggest issues we have right now is that in this place of fear and concern and regrounding, restabilizing and what's normal and what's not, we have um, made second priority our ability to look across the street, across the way um, at our neighbor. Um, mm. however you, however you want to define that and it's, and, and it's, um, stalling progress. Uh, and so I think that, that, um, intentional empathy, um, would be what I would recommend. I feel the need. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I think that's what's going to make the world better, right? If we are teaching our young people, but ourselves, we're modeling it as well. So absolutely. Could not. Um, and where can we read your poems? Where can you read my poems? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, so, you know, you can uh, Google, obviously. Uh, so it's Tanya Maria Matthews. So when I write, I write under uh, my middle name. Um, I also uh, have written and performed under my stage name, um, which is uh, Ja Hipster. And so that's J-A-H-I-P-S-T-E-R. Uh, so you can also find some stuff uh, floating out and about in that space. That but, is um, so cool. But I'm also hoping to be more intentional about that, uh, combining uh, my multiple uh, personas, not personalities, yeah, <laughs> but multiple yeah. personas uh, into a space that's more accessible uh, for me and for everyone else. We're going to Google that for sure. Um, <laughs> all right, Tonya, this was such a delight. Thank you for spending time and for sharing your deepest reflections with us. Um, I hope yes, you're I better for this. I appreciate this. Yes, I definitely is. Like I said, reflection is key. Yeah, and we're going to come to the museum when it's open. Yes, you are. Yes. <laughs>